six packs in a big bag of ice. To two six packs in a big bag of ice. Hey, it's Bobby from New Jersey back for a video. I know it's been about two years since the last one and uh, many years before that since there's been any real content on this channel. Uh, one of the interesting things I wanted to bring up today was that uh, I've just hit a couple of anniversary milestones in, uh, in my hobby of brewing and uh, I thought it'd be kind of interesting to capture some of the footage uh, of today. It was uh, Christmas of 2005 that my new wife at the time uh, had got me like one of those Mr. Beer kits for Christmas. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't Mr. Beer, it was actually even a, a lesser known brand, uh, but as expected it made pretty horrible beer and uh, I almost didn't think you can make beer at home after that. But then I got, you know, a, a kit, a proper five or six gallon bucket brewing kit from More Beer I believe at the time. and. Uh, made a few batches and ultimately I got really hooked into the hobby and um, just uh, about six months after that in 2006 actually uh, 16 years ago today I signed up for a username on homebrewtalk.com and started really doing a lot of research and uh, making a lot of friends there and uh, I was pretty much on track for you know all grain brewing at that point and uh, I also started building a kegerator. So, you know, about a year into brewing, uh, around Christmas of 2006, you know, I was brewing some decent beers and I was, I was definitely already invested in the hobby and I knew I'd be sticking with it for some time. I, I didn't know it was gonna be this long, but at the time I was pretty happy with my brewing. And then um, advance around to, you know, July, I actually brewed, um, like a, a summer bitter, it was kind of like a, by today's definitions, it would have been like a British golden. And that beer ultimately, uh, when I was sitting outside in the middle of the summer with a pint of that beer, uh, I was finally convinced that I can make commercial quality craft beer at home. And uh, that was sort of a turning point for me because uh, if I had continued making somewhat mediocre batches at that point, uh, I probably would have given up the hobby. So I kind of attribute that beer to keeping me invested in the hobby and realizing that you can make better and better beer as long as you do some research and, and are willing to make some changes in your brewing process and your perspective on the entire uh, hobby uh, it ultimately just ends up in improving. So uh, because that was 15 years ago, um, just two weeks ago, I, I kind of surpassed that 15 year anniversary, but I'm gonna be doing uh, a clone of that batch and I'm gonna be as true to the recipe as I possibly can with a couple of exceptions just because of uh, logistical issues. Uh, for one, uh, I can't really brew with the same exact water profile. Uh, I was living on a municipal, uh, I was at a municipal water supply uh, at my previous house and I can't really duplicate that profile perfectly because I use RO uh, water and augment it. So I'm gonna be just using uh, a water profile that I would normally use for a bitter. And, uh, but I'm not gonna modify the grain bill at all. Uh, it's a little bit quirky. It was probably the first time that I actually um, put a recipe together from scratch rather than either brewing a kit or using a recipe out of a book. And now that I look at it, you know, I was using just American two row for my bitter, which I would use Maris Otter or Golden Promise on now, but I'm not gonna modify the recipe at all. I'm just gonna brew it as is. Um, uh, I'm gonna show a little bit of the video. Uh, I, I think this was the first video I posted on YouTube of me actually brewing an all grain batch. Um, I remember it being in two parts because at that time YouTube had a 10 minute time limit on videos and I just couldn't compact it down to a 10 minute brew day. Uh, my all grain setup was like very hokey at the time. It was um, cobbled together. The burner was about to collapse and I was probably on the verge of br uh, burning my garage down at the time. Uh, my brew system has progressed quite a bit. My system is uh, much more efficient. It's electric. I can brew indoors without any carbon monoxide problems. But I just recently rewatched this video uh, in its entirety. And one of the things that 
it's kind of interesting to me is just how intensely committed I was to the hobby that early on. I, um, I was uh, cooling my fermenter down uh, using a water bath with a bunch of uh, ice bottles that I would switch out. Uh, I was using an oxygen tank to, to oxygenate the wort. I was uh, rehydrating my dry yeast at the time. And, you know, those are uh, kind of, like I said, details that I would have expected that I picked up, you know, in the last eight years or something, you know, but certainly not uh, so early. And I just thought that was kind of interesting how your perception of time is just so skewed. I, I just can't believe it's been 15 years. Anyway, enough introduction stuff. I'll just give you some of the highlights of the brew day today. And, um, you know, maybe you can appreciate the uh, advancements in camera technology over the last 15 years. I think the previous uh, one was recorded on the only little point and shoot digital camera that I had at the time, and it recorded video in 240. Uh, and now we're running a 4K on this video. So, um, I hope you can appreciate that upgrade. Uh, we'll see if the beer is an upgrade as well. 5SRM is on the you know much lighter side of an ordinary bitter. Usually get a lot of the mid caramel coloring in those bitters. This was intended to be a really easy drinking hot summer beer, and uh, it's you know I remember it being really nice and dry and drinkable. Uh, some of the weird things about this recipe, I'll probably show a better screenshot of it than just holding up this brew sheet to the camera. Um, but I want 80% uh, plain uh, pale brewer's malt, 8.9% uh, crystal uh, or caramel 10L, 8.9% uh, Munich, light Munich, and uh, 4 ounces of Victory. That's a biscuit malt, which I, I do feel is appropriate for the style of beer. It's just kind of interesting how I have Munich in there. Uh, I did note that I used uh, Fuggle uh, at 60, 20, and 5 minutes in the original recipe. I don't know what the IBU calculation of that recipe was at the time. Uh, I was using one ounce of Fuggle for each of those additions in the video, but I just did some calculations now, and I feel like uh, an ounce at the alphas that I'm working with now uh, would have been a little bit light. Uh, the IBUs calculate on this one out to 36 with an original gravity of 1044, uh, which you know should end up being about a 4.4% ABV beer. And I'm gonna mash at 153, uh, start there in this recipe. So I'm just going to weigh out my brewing salts and my, I always, set up some cups and label them with the timing of the addition. So like this one, this one just says 60, then it says mid and late. So I don't, I don't want to have to keep uh, relabeling the cups, but I always have these sort of laid out. I put my wall flock tablet, any nutrients in here so that I don't forget. And uh, so I use this 100 gram scale for all of the measurements. This, uh, starting with RO water in the tank, and uh, I'm going to be adding uh, calcium chloride, gypsum, and some uh, canning salt to achieve a profile um, that a brew father is considering to be an ordinary bitter uh, style. Uh, 77 ppm calcium, uh, 43 of sodium, 87 program. So I'm, this is match step one. I'm gonna hit 158 degrees. Step one time. I'm gonna hold, so it's not gonna do any timing. It's just gonna sit here and hold 158 until I come back and do something. And that something is uh, stir the grain in. And so then once I continue that after the grain stirred in, match step two, 153 for 65 minutes or an hour and five minutes. Then we're going to go uh, 159 for 10 minutes, 159 and hold. So it's going to at least run for 10 minutes and then sound the alarm. And then if I'm distracted and I can't get over here, it's just going to hold that 159 until I get back. Once I pull the grain out, I'm going to continue it. It's going to ramp up to 208. 
and just go for one minute of hold time. Once that happens, it's going to advance to uh, a power mode, 52%, and it's going to start the one hour timer. And then I have mash temperature zero, just to say that that's the end of the program. All right, so uh, it's trying to heat, but it can't until I hit enable. And it's heating, I'm also going to put my pump on. This is just to stir the water while I'm heating. Just uh, sucking up some of the water and squirting it back out to clean out this uh, this needle here because the lactic acid can corrode this on the inside if you leave the acid in there. All right, I use a little Pyrex uh, measuring cup here for my salts because I find that they dissolve better if I stir them up with some water in here. So. I'm not going to add these salts until the water gets warmer. It kind of uh, more easily dissolves these when it's warm. So um, I'm just going to wait, but I, I leave it here so that I don't forget. Salt's mixed in there since we hit our 158. It's just holding there for us now. I was probably distracted for about 10 extra minutes, so the whole feature is nice. smart thing for me to do is to advance the, the next step to the mash temperature so that as I add the grain, the controller is not continuously adding heat. So I continue to the 153. <clears throat> now I'm going to throw in a bag grind on this uh, grain here so it's running the gap at, at something like uh, 20 thousandths or something like that so nice and fine I'm going in the bag so it's not a problem All right, so just gonna let it stir at the bottom, recirculate over the top at about a quart per minute, and let the controller do its thing at this point. Uh, once it reaches uh, within a degree of the 153 target, it'll start that 65 minute timer and you know, just run the mash for me. Um, just in case something goes on with my controller, uh, I also use Brewfather as my brewing software right now. 
So what I like to do is open up Brewfather on my phone and run the brew day timer. And uh, that helps me kind of keep track of where I am in the brew day in case I have to step away or do something else. So just uh, start my timer and then I can kind of walk away and uh, it'll alert me when something needs to happen. I'm a little bit late. I, I just wanted to check the mash pH and uh, do a quick gravity reading on it. I'm usually doing this at 15 to 20 minutes into the mash, but again, I got distracted, I'm working, so um, I'm gonna pull a sample. I always keep like a, a dish of uh, water in the refrigerator to quickly cool my samples down. Milwaukee uh, 102 pH meter. So mash pH is 5.40. Um, in a rare case, it's exactly what Brewfather predicted. Uh, though, you know, normally we do it 15 minutes into the mash, so it could be a little bit different than the, where it was going to be. Um, check the gravity really quickly. I use uh, the Easy Dens for that. The reason I like it is that it really doesn't require a lot of uh, work input. The one downside is that you do need to open up your app for that to work, but small price to pay for the uh, convenience and accuracy of this thing. Gravity at 30 minutes into the mash is 10.37. The estimated pre-boil is 10.36, so I'm already at a point above the estimated pre-boil. What I'll likely do in this case is that if at the end of the mash my pre-boil is a little bit high, I'll probably just throw a little bit of uh, distilled water in there, uh, RO water, uh, just to get me back to the uh, projected uh, 1036. This is supposed to be a 4.4 percent ABV beer. I really don't want a five, so I'm just going to watch the gravity and compensate for that. Put some gloves on for this in case I want to squeeze the bag or what have you. Use a loop of power cord to choke the bag. So I'm trying something a little bit new. Uh, this is the first time that I'm looping this rope over a second pulley so that I can pull it down instead of lifting up. And we'll see if this works. That's pretty cool. I, I definitely have a little bit of advantage there. And uh, just let it sit above the liquid about two inches while it naturally drains and I'll come in here and just gather up all the slack above here and that provides enough squeeze on the grain to kind of get another cord out of it. So instead of grabbing the, the, the large mass of grain, I just gather all of the loose material right above the grain and then I just kind of squeeze downward. 
this a little bit. Alright, that's about all the squeezing I do, and then I go right into a bucket. Once you do this several times, you, you kind of figure out how not to make a mess. I literally have not dropped a single drop of wort when I transferred it over into the bucket. And that's going to go get dumped out on the compost pile in the back and rinse the bag out. That's all there is to it. And uh, next thing I like to do is uh, turn on the pump. Turning on the pump at this phase, any silty grain particles that came out of the bag during the squeeze may have settled on top of the element. And if I turn the, the uh, pump on and allow the wort to whirlpool a bit, that flow and current will be knocking any of that siltiness off the top of the element before I fire it back up again. Uh, there have been occasions where people have issues uh, burning a little bit of uh, proteins on their element over the course of the boil and I think it happens at this phase right now where um, the element's going to come on quite hot to bring it up to the boil and any particles that might be sitting on it there's no boil activity yet to move it out of the way so you don't really want static work to sort of settle on top of the element before you turn it on so if you don't have whirlpooling or a pump uh, using a mash paddle or a spoon get in there and give the work a good stir before you fire the element Hit continue, and now it's going to bring up to 208 Fahrenheit, and then switch over to the uh, the boil percentage or power output of 52 percent. I don't run the the whirlpooling of the pump much further than like 180 degrees. All right, we got the 20 minute hop addition going in. Uh, ounce and a half of funnel. Ended up overshooting the pre boil gravity, uh, came out to like 1040 instead of 1037, so I threw about uh, 0.6 gallons in there and got it up to or down to 1037 uh, with about 9 gallons of pre boil and just finishing up. All right, five minute addition, world flock and servomyces nutrient. Okay, boils over. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention was that I, I usually put my oxygen wand into the boil in the last minute or two, uh, just to sanitize the stone. And I also put the uh, the recirculation hose, I dangle that over into the wort as well so that the end connector uh, can get sanitized because I usually drop that into my fermenter to fill the fermenters. And uh, I also just turn the pump on real quick to circulate some of the hot boiling wort through that hose because that's going to be delivering my chilled wort into the fermenter after everything gets cooled down. So I just want to show the clarity of that work. You know, when you let it sit for 40 minutes after whirlpooling, it really does a great job of uh, clarifying everything. This is before dry. Since I'm only fermenting about two and three quarters each, I'm not going to rehydrate this, and this is a month and a half old pack of Omega. It's about the right cell count for this beer. This 
the uh, Omega British L8, which is also London ESB. It's a, or WLP002. It's a highly flocculent strain, so you got to really get that mixed. About 30 seconds of oxygen. Tuck this away in the refrigerator, and uh, that's about it. All right, so brew day complete. I, um, I apologize for not really doing anything structured here. I was just kind of showing you a couple of the uh, processes that I run through these days and using an old recipe that I, I thought was a turning point in the hobby for me. And it's pretty amazing that, you know, 16 years later, I um, this is my full-time career now, total... 180 on my career path and I, I'm just very thankful that I was able to find my calling and that I, I have a career now that I feel is you know not really working as much as uh, the corporate life felt like and uh, I appreciate all those uh, years of you guys watching these videos um, you know it's uh, nice to touch base with you guys again and show you what I'm up to and I will follow up to let you know how this beer came out. Hopefully it is as good as I remember it being and maybe even better. See you soon.